In part two here, we're going to cover a lot of uh, details on surface grinding, uh, some uh, things about magnetic holding power, stoning, and uh, how parts can crash, crash modes, what to look for in setting up your parts. So it uh, should be interesting if you're interested in surface grinding. Um, definitely want to watch this. I have to take about a hundred and six thousandths this way parallel to this face uh, down about uh, pretty far down so uh, I want to st stage these on the chuck such that I can do that to all the pieces all at once so I'm going to rest up against a thick parallel I have against my back rail here and I'm going to actually seat on that 45 face where I can feel it and slide across I know I've got good engagement and now I'm going to bring up a uh, backing block to sit and hold that piece such that it's captive meaning if this part ties to scoot it can't it has to squish this block backwards uh, skid this block on the chuck which is possible but not likely so I'm making sure I'm perfectly seated there on the on the I'm pressing in against this and then seating the other block in tight against it now the point one of the points that I want to bring out here is I slide this up in, slide the next one up in, and everything looks hunky-dory. Okay, beautiful. It sits on here at the same time. But the catch is, right here, you notice I've got clearance right here in between those. Uh, this has only got about a thousandth of an inch or so. But before I did this to the part right there, which I'm allowed to do since I designed the part, um, uh, this is non-functional back here. This corner was hitting here at this point before this seated here. So what that means is, is that this wasn't as stable as it could be by being actually totally nested. So that's why I uh, took these that corner off rounded that and staging these. Now these are actually seating into each other very nicely good and firm. There's nothing ultra precision about this uh, thing here. It's really just clearance uh, for the insert for chips and stuff to flow. But um, this is a, a good way to nest them. This is another example of blocking. Paying attention to what's going on in your part here. You gotta make sure that uh, if that thing was, if that, if I didn't take that corner off, there would be a gap here, and this thing would either want to sit against here or here. It wouldn't actually nest firmly, and it could squirm. By getting rid of that corner, so that I know that I've got a good seat on the back here and here only, uh, then I know that I'm, I've got a good situation where that thing's not going to carry on. Touching off on the face of the parts and setting my dial at zero, then we're lifting up over the parts coming down and here we're going to touch off on the top set zero on the uh, down feed dial so we know what we're doing cooling on and now we're just uh, plunge grinding down there uh, through the magic of video we're down to the bottom already and there's the relief that we cut in the corner radius there from the wheel doesn't matter you have to be careful on uh, burrs on this when you go to measure so you'll notice there I'm feeling the burr I'm using a, a little diamond uh, file there to just get the uh, burr off that edge so when I measure I'm not being fooled by the uh, raised edge on there. Just using the tail of the calipers there to measure. And here we're using the clamps as usual to press down and twist off the uh, rock, the parts up on one edge to break loose the, uh, the uh, suction from the coolant and the residual magnetism. Using the Nipex uh, parallel pliers there. Nice, nice pliers. They're very handy. Popping off the uh, back parallel we were using as our reference edge there. A 1, 2, 3 block behind the magnetic V block just to get the axis of the V parallel to our travel. Uh, it's somewhat important on uh, this because we're going into a corner. The other things we did where we were putting a flat on and we could traverse the wheel across, the actual alignment of this wasn't critical even though it was aligned because it was in the uh, grinding vise. Uh, you, in theory, could just throw that on there and not really worry about the angle. In this case, since we edge of the wheel's got to come into a corner on the parts, it's important that it's uh, lined up. One interesting note is that um, a solid one-two-three block is very handy on the grinder 
because uh, it's hard to get off because you have to use the clamp to get it off the table. But um, it's nice because it's not full of holes and full of uh, coolant and everything getting into all the holes. So um, instead of those, these are just cheapies, uh, but they're, it's very handy for uh, grinding where you, you just don't want all the cleanup uh, mess of blowing all the holes out. Just a little side note here about uh, magnetic holding strength. Uh, stoning these blocks that we're using to uh, block in these parts is very important because uh, surface finish has a great effect on the actual holding strength of, uh, for a given material for how much it's uh, going to actually grip. If we start with uh, a lapped surface as being 100% uh, the maximum that you're going to get, which it is. Uh, if you have the chuck was lapped and the part was lapped, uh, that's going to give you the absolute maximum flux transfer across, the, across that surface. If you back down to just finished ground, you're only going to get 80 to 90 percent of that value. If you have a rough grind, you're going to be in the 60 to 70 percent range. And something like rough plane, you're down in the 30 to 50 percent holding power. So that's why surface finish and stoning is important because just a burr lifting the part off even to just a tenth or two off the, the surface is basically creating a gap there that that flux is trying to get through through air which is a very poor magnetic conductor. So important to realize that surface finish of your parts and your blocking has uh, a big effect on it as does the material. Uh, low carbon steels, your best uh, grip these blocks are actually ductile iron, which is only about uh, maybe 60% of the actual holding strength that these would be if they were made out of mild steel. So just happen to have the iron blocks there. They're already ground up like that, and they're plenty strong enough for this. So here we're staging these parts uh, at a 45 degree. And um, another little note is that I'm resting on these bottom corners right here of the part, and those have been chamfered by hand. So they are variable. They are not a you know perfectly uniform situation. For this um, particular situation, it's not really important. As always, we want to look at this and say, what's the failure mode? If I press down and back on this, how's this going to going to fail? It's going to fall away from the wheel. It's going to get pushed out of the wheel. We have a we have, do not have a crash situation in this particular staging. But if I don't do something to keep these parts from scooting like that. Uh, they will, and so that's why I'm going to, uh, and yes, I just stoned that part that just dropped off the back there. So I'm coming in here and supporting these, pressing these down. I'm going to turn my magnet on just a trifle to get these to uh, sit properly. And uh, then we're just going to traverse across to um, get that magnet turned on just a little bit. And we're going to tra traverse across these to get this uh, to be. I'm going to come in here and get on the get on my indicator. And we'll traverse across here and oh look at that! Get out of town. Some guys have all the luck. Okay, that piece is sitting crooked. So now we'll back this away, get this to sit properly. And bring in the block to just touch. <laughs> That's funny. Now that one's got a little angle on it. For what we're doing, it's, it's not a problem whatsoever. But I'm going to tap this in a little bit. Okay. That's good enough. We'll turn the magnet on full. I did not stage that. That is just pure luck. So now we have these lined up so that that 45 is straight and we can come in here with the grinding wheel and get down. Now I do have to pay attention and realize that I'm not going to be able to traverse here. The grinding wheel is just going to clear. Matter of fact, I need to check here. Am I actually going to clear? I'm not. I'm going to run into these blocks. These blocks are too thick. So I'm just going to uh, back up, regroup. I'll come back with a little skinnier block and we'll carry on. Plunge grinding here to from where we just set up and um, just down feeding uh, 
and I'm starting to notice something's a little, uh, little uh, squirmy here, so I'm going to stop and take a look. Uh, you're going to love this. So, uh, Mr. Technical here telling you all about magnetic force and paying attention and lines of flux and blah, blah, blah. Well, <laughs> uh, and all that, I'm forgetting the fact that the actual, if I take this piece here, the chuck is on right now. Now, you, you notice this is like got next to no holding power right here. Well, just like I said, lines of flux in this V-block come from here to here. They, they cross through this direction. So in order to get any grip, you have to have a good intimate area that, that the lines of flux can carry through the part and come back into the magnet. Well, we've got a knife edge here, like no contact. That's why these parts are not actually being held. There's a little bit of attraction this way, I mean, as far as pulling off this direction. But there's no, there's no attraction that way. So, beautiful example of a total fail on the, the setup in the sense that I'm not paying attention to the fact that uh, I, don't have any, I don't have any surface area for lines of flux to get through. So, good and bad. Um, so, we'll grab these in another way and carry on. But uh, I'm glad that happened and seeing that that's a prime example of paying attention to knowing where the lines of flux are traveling in the, in the magnet. Very simple on this, it's just from here to here. Um, on a regular chuck, it gets a little more complicated with um, uh, intermediate poles and things like that, and we'll cover that another day. So let's not waste the uh, part of the setup that's, that's functional here. I'm going to take my toolmaker's vise, turn that on. Now I can just stage these parts again in the vise, the same way we did last time, except this time we're going to just grip them in the vise where we've got a, a solid hold. So I now have tapped these in to be in the ballpark. That's plenty good enough for what we're doing here. I don't need to be, I mean this is ridiculous anyhow. The, this, uh, this whole thing is an exercise in uh, looking at the surface grinder in a different perspective as a metal removing machine and one that setups uh, are a whole lot easier and uh, sometimes quicker than trying to mill this. Every feature on here that I've done could have been milled and this thing would have been just fine uh, as a functional part. But holding them, staging them and everything in the mill with higher cutting forces, interrupted uh, more pounding cutting forces of end mills and things, holding them uh, and holding them in mass uh, is not always as easy because you can't hold things necessarily magnetically. So the magnetic aspect of holding these uh, parts over here on the grinder and realizing that the uh, grinder is a, is a metal removing machine. You, you, uh, you can take material off pretty quickly and um, doing all these different facets and setting up in the mill I'm just about guarantee it would take longer by the time you got done staging them and uh, a lot of times having to do each piece individually as opposed to ganging, them, ganging the parts the way that I've been able to do here on the grinder. So that's, that's really the purpose of this video is think about your surface grinder in a different way. It's a metal removing machine. It's not just some uh, pretty finish generating machine and uh, flat surfaces and that's it. Think of it like a, a bridge port with a grinding wheel. Whatever you can do with your erector set to get the parts staged properly, um, go for it and, and, uh, and you'll, you'll have a lot more versatility with what you do in your grinder. I'll try this again. Uh, plunging down get to the bottom we will slowly traverse across there they are finished uh, matched up in the corner there nicely and we're done again never slide if you if you can avoid it look for some means of popping off the parts this is just a piece of carbon fiber rod uh, shape down on the one end. Uh, it's nice and stiff and, and, and r very rigid but not marring, it doesn't mar the parts so it's a, it's a great pry bar for on the chuck. Here are the two blocks. Uh, there's three of each. This is the straight holder, this is the 45 degree holder and uh, all the features are on here uh, grind wise except for the uh, relief on this face here and the relief on this face here but I don't want to do those until I have my pockets cut in because I'm going to just be stay about ten thousandths away from the bottom of the pocket. So I'd rather do that visual on the actual pocket being there. So now I'm going to go uh, put the rest of the holes in here 
and uh, we'll go over and mill the um, insert pocket. So here we have our part ready to mill uh, the details here for the pocket and uh, we're centering this on the vise so that we get a, a good grip, no distortion on the vise. I'm using a uh, spare jaw as my backer here to be able to get in and clamp on this and still leave room for the milling operation out here. Uh, the only issue now is with my stop on here is how do I edge find my stop. Uh, that's a good time to just uh, use the technique of putting a 1-2-3 block in temporarily to establish that and that lets you get the type of stop you want even though you can't edge find directly on the piece since your 1-2-3 block is nice and square perpendicular everywhere you can come in here and edge find on this to get your location then put your parts back in so that's just a, a technique that might not be obvious uh, to get the location of a stop. You might be tempted to edge find on your stop, but uh, who knows where the stop, the topography of that stop, whether you're going to hit the high point with your edge finder or not. So, um, just a technique. Here we're edge finding on the one, two, three block, getting the two uh, X and Y position. Used an eighth inch four flute carbide ball mill at 4200 RPM to just establish the location for the 1 8 drilled hole. Because of the angled surface there, I've got to go down far enough to get a decent seat for the drill. Now we're drilling. That's just the clearance hole for the back of the insert pocket. Same this. The, we're just switching back and forth between the two different styles, the straight and the 45. Now we're using a um, four flute carbide uh, coated end mill to go in and uh, do the main um, top removal. It's basically the shape of the pocket above the insert and that's what's being removed now. And um, that's the one for the straight. You can see the pocket there, the relief in the back. The actual insert pocket's not in yet. Now we're doing the same thing on the um, 45 degree where we're doing the just the main clearance pocket down to where the top of the insert will be. And now we're doing the actual insert pocket. Uh, we're milling that out 330 seconds end mill. There's the one for the 45 degree. Now we're coming in with the tapered end mill, the 14 degree included angle, 7 degrees on the side to match the um, clearance angle of the insert. So we're just taking an actual single pass there, cutting the, um, the face. And we're actually adjusting that to get the screw to have the right amount of preload when we try an insert in there. Now we're doing the uh, tap drill for quarter 28 in the tail end of these for the adjuster screw, threaded hole, putting that in the tapping head, spiral point, uh, tap, tap in the hole. Now we're coming over to set up to drill the um, uh, edge findering and for our location. We have a stop there to the right. You can see the little rod stop. This is the pilot hole for milling the um, slot using a 3 16 four flute end mill there. Just using the slot routine in the mill to mill the um, actual slots really works nice doing slots on a CNC. You just do a much nicer job than just using a regular end mill. So there's the pocket for, that's for a quarter 20 screw. Now I'm setting up a 15 degrees on the vise with the angle block in the bottom there to grind the clearance at, under the insert. Uh, had them staged like before there we've ground off just to the lip. I'm checking to see with an insert in there. Still have a little lip there. You saw me check with the tool. I'm still catching a little bit. I want to be just flush with the bottom of the insert. We'll go back and take another uh, another pass off there. Take a few more thousandths off, and we'll try it again because uh, we don't we want that supporting the insert fully, but we don't want it poking out at all where it could actually um, cause any clearance issues. Blowing it out, putting the insert in. Seating it firmly and then checking, okay, now we've got a situation where the, um, the tool does not catch. So there we are with the um, tool as, um, as is with just the deburring we did 
to not get in trouble while you're handling the parts in the grind uh, situations. Here is a part after we've actually chamfered it, rounded the corners, uh, put a little spherical corner break on, on the corners there, and uh, chamfered a little bit more significant. Um, the spherical corners definitely work uh, very nicely to make a, a nice, nice looking and nice fitting part. Now we take sanding sponges, just uh, cheap har hazard fraught harbor freight uh, sanding sponges. Roll the edges over. Uh, basically, we're deburring our deburring, and it uh, really puts a nice look on things. I threaded toothpicks into my tapped holes before I go into the glass bead cabinet. Um, glass bead and tapped holes can be problematic at times, so that's what those are in there for. Here's the straight holder uh, after glass beading. Um, glass bead just uh, makes everything look pretty. Um, just a nice uniform finish. This is the same thing with the 45 degree holder. Um, so this is the finish that it'll get before going in for the vacuum harden air temper treatment. Here's a group of parts back from the um, heat treat process. In this case, uh, vacuum harden air temper. Now vacuum hardened means that it's uh, in a vacuum atmosphere during the actual uh, temperature rise aspect of it and also a controlled atmosphere quench. Um, so the, the actual rate of cooling is controlled by how they in, inject other uh, gases in to uh, quench these parts. So these parts um, actually if they were not tempered would be bright they would look just like they did when I sent them out the um, sandblast or excuse me, glass bead finish uh, the, the brown haze you see on here is the just the natural uh, color temperature of the metal in a air atmosphere so if I didn't want these to have this color or if I needed them to be softer where the temperature would get high enough to start scaling then I would request a vacuum hardened vacuum temper, which is significantly more expensive. So typically you avoid that unless it's absolutely necessary. One, uh, one little note here that might be helpful to you uh, if you ever send things like this out is if you have parts where you don't want to have a hardness test on the piece, then um, it's always good to send a test puck. Right there you see the actual diamond indentation where they check the hardness of this piece. On these pieces, it doesn't really matter. Probably, if I thought about it, I might have sent a test puck along just so that we didn't didn't have this. But it's it's of no consequence on this part. So uh, there's lots of parts that I do where it does matter, and you'll see here. Uh, typically, you would actually like to use the actual piece off the same bar. The tool steels, if you're getting tool steels from a really good supplier, it's not going to make a whole lot of difference unless you're doing some kind of extremely tight hardness tolerance which you know, probably isn't going to uh, matter that much anyhow so here's a bar sent with test puck marks um, here's a piece, piece where we're doing round and we have the test puck so the the, the heat treater we give them instructions to say uh, hardness test on p test puck only and they will then say okay customers requested that so it's okay just to test this and um, assume which is always dangerous that all the other parts will be the same hardness of this and most of the stuff that you typically do the, the hardness itself isn't that critical that if you're off a, a point or two one way or another isn't going to be life or death on on whether the parts function properly so just a note there um, some people might not think about the test puck uh, to be used for that so these these uh, the vacuum hardening is just nice with these these parts basically will have been uh, very very minutely dimensionally changed um, there are charts on uh, what kind of growth or shrinkage there is on the actual heat treat part of the cycle and then change from that in the temper part of the cycle so you can calculate reasonably accurately what these parts how they're going to change a part like this the amount of um, change in dimensions that occurs from heat treat is, is basically irrelevant the one thing is is that with the vacuum heat treat um, things are very uniform, it's a very controlled rate of, uh, of um, heat rise, um, there's no oxidation at all, 
So that's why I could send these parts out basically completely finished. Um, I'm not even going to touch these. I'm not going to change anything. These are totally functional as is. The oxide uh, on there actually is uh, somewhat of a rust uh, preventative compared to the bare parts. So uh, just some notes on heat treat. Some other parts here that I have to do. Some spindle shafts and things that went out in the same batch. And uh, so consider uh, uh, in my case here it costs including the UPS charges it costs me about a hundred dollars maybe a hundred and ten dollars depending on the weight to send out a batch for um, vacuum hardened air temper uh, yeah, that might seem like a lot of money but compared to all the other things involved and no scaling and all that um, I consider it a bargain and of course I'm doing parts typically where the customers you know paying for this but uh, I realize for hobby use, $100 for heat treat is like uh, scary. But so depending on the project, the amount of uh, other labor you're going to end up doing to counteract all the problems and possible failures of your heat treat, doing it, uh, you know, doing it at home, uh, might be something worth considering. So I've changed my mind and uh, thinking about these pieces being 58 to 62 Rockwell and being in a structural situation where there's going to be a bolt tightened in this. Uh, and who knows what kind of um, forces are going to be applied to it? That's that's pretty um, that's pretty hard. Uh, main reason that, that they, those were that hard um, is that that was the the heat treat uh, requirements for that batch. So I said, you know what? That's really not the ideal. So I have a hot plate here that I converted by putting a um, PID controller on. I have a solid state relay on the back so that this thing can cycle and this thing holds uh, temperature very nicely so threw these on um, and uh, just covered them up with some aluminum foil tent and uh, as you see there and um, took them up to the place where the um, toughness and the hardness are at their uh, happy place uh, which I'll show you here you can see this is the heat treat response chart for A2 and this is the hardness and you'll see that we're coming down here and uh, the this is the toughness well within the realm of the hardness that we need to stay in this is the peak for the toughness so that peak if we look down here was eh, maybe 625 625 degrees so that's going to give me uh, around 58 57 Rockwell which is still plenty hard enough for a, um, a tool holder but give me the maximum toughness yes toughness goes down as it gets softer and softer um, but obviously we don't want it that soft um, for a tool holder that's going to be um, uh, in a tough environment. So just a note there looking on the, the actual heat treat charts to see what would be ideal. So I toasted these at 625 and that's where that uh, dark dark purple um, gray color came from. Thanks for watching. I hope this was uh, educational, inspirational, any of the above. Uh, if you enjoyed this uh, and you're not a subscriber, please subscribe and share with your friends and um, come on back for some more. Thanks.